Good day, my fellow yogic travelers. I am mighty glad to be alive, and I hope that you are too. This week we're going into Buddhism and the Dharma tributaries of that lineage that has fed into my river flow, and I hope it will share some light and wisdom with you. So take whatever medicine you can from it. And the basic story of the Buddha, which means the awakened one, was he was born a prince, but the father's court astrologer told him that your son has all the markings of a world savior, so if you want him to take over the family business, don't let him see what the world is, because his heart is going to break, and then he'll want to save everybody instead of just being the king. And so the father, the king, said, well, I want my son to take my place, so you know, we'll have to like not let him see the world. So he built a pleasure grove for him and only had young people attending it. And it was always freshly uh, painted and all the garbage was cleaned away. So he saw nothing about deterioration. It was just young, beautiful people around him as he grew up. It was it was fantastic. But as things happen in these stories, like all heroes journey, the, the village compound um, was too small. And so one day he ordered his charioteer to take him outside uh, and the charioteer, of course, didn't want to do it. He says, listen, I'm the prince. You've got to listen to me. So against the king's orders, the charioteer took him outside. And in three successive nights, he saw what they called the three heavenly messengers. And the first one was uh, a person who was sick. And he asked the charioteer, is this some kind of anomaly of nature? Because he never saw anybody who was ill before. And the charioteer said, no, happens to everybody. And that shook him a little bit. The second night, he saw somebody who was an old man walking with a cane bent hobbled over and uh, not looking too uh, vital. And he said, is, is this like just a, a singular case? He says, no, no, everybody gets old. Oh, really, really touched him. And the third night he saw somebody uh, being carried to the funeral pyres, you know, um, a dead person. And he asked the charioteer, what was this? Another anomaly of nature, right? He says, no, no, everybody dies. That's it. He freaked out. And then he went on the fourth night. And the fourth night he saw a bhikshu or a, a wandering mendicant. And the guy was golden. He only had a bowl and a, and a begging cloth, a be, um, you know, a, a loincloth and a begging bowl. But he was radiant, radiant. And when the Buddha found out who he was, he said, well, this is someone who's renounced the world to seek enlightenment. Well, that was it. He went home that night, cut off his top knot, and left that night and began his renunciation. And apparently for six years or so, he did severe asceticism. His tapas was so much that he ended up being so much like skin and bones that you could see his spine through his front front body. And then some milkmaid gave him a cup of milk out of compassion for his deteriorated state. And he got such a rush of energy there that he realized at that point the middle way between hedonism and asceticism is right because he had done all the intense ascetic practices at the time and it didn't really do it for him. And so that's when he said, now I'm going to sit down and meditate and he sat under what became the bow tree the enlightenment tree and he made that vow may my bones turn to dust if i move from this place before i get enlightened and of course for him fortunately he didn't have to test how true that was because he did get enlightened according to the stories and at that point you know he spent seven days thinking about is it possible to even communicate this to anybody and then uh, the gods and the, all the other beings on the different dimensions came and begged him for, the, for their sake and the sake of humanity to spin the wheel of the Dharma. And that's what he did. And so basically his main message was not metaphysical. When he was initially asked, they asked if you're a god, he said, no, I'm just awake. And when people would ask him questions about, you know, is there a soul and is there life after death? And obviously he talked at different times about his own past incarnations. So there's a hint there, but he wouldn't really go into it directly when someone would question him. He would ask them questions that would deal with what his discovery was, which is the nature of suffering, what the cause of suffering, how to end the cause of suffering, and then the path to end the cause of suffering, called the Eightfold Path, which we'll discuss at another time. Very, very similar to Ashtanga Yoga, as yoga lays it out in its version of how to deal with the question of suffering and human mortality. But to give you an example of where his mindset was at, and how he tried to teach people for their own benefit. There's a story of a man who came to the Buddha who wanted to know metaphysical truths, pondering the infinite, pondering the great questions that everybody asked themselves 
which seems to come out of the mystery of his existence. So on a certain level, no matter how long we've been huddling, to, huddling together in the dark around the fire, and even before we even had fire, wondering, nobody knows the ultimate mystery. It's really shrouded in a certain kind of super essential darkness that just drops our jaw in the awesome and awful aspect of existence and just try to take in the magnificence of it while at the same time not having a clue beyond a certain level of what is really going on. And, you know, it's just like science now. We know just enough to be able to say some things about what's going on, but not enough to really think we have it down. And maybe there will always be a level of mystery beyond which we can't an uh, answer rationally or empirically, and I guess that's where faith comes in. But nonetheless, the Buddha didn't want to do that. And so when the person pushed them to get metaphysical truth, he said, listen, let me give you a little story. There once was a man who was shot by a poisoned arrow. And as soon as his family and friends started to tend to him, he said, no, 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 I don't want you to take this poisoned arrow out until you answer these questions for me. What was the name of the person who shot me? What clan did they come from? What kind of arrow was the wood made of? What kind of tip did the arrow have? And what kind of poison did men use? What kind of feathers were there on the arrow? What kind of bow was the arrow shot from? And so forth. That man would die before he got the answers to those questions. Isn't it more important for him to get the poisoned arrow out to allow the healing process to begin? And the longer you keep it in, the longer you could say it infects the whole system and puts you at risk. It's one way of talking about it. So relative to just this one truth, without saying that any human being doesn't have the right or even the desire, the inner impulse to, to ask those questions and try to come to some sense of peace, if possible. But the Buddha was more practical. And so whether or not we can ever get into the understanding, at least our projection of the understanding of what we think a Buddha mind is all about, but we do have an incredible DNA in every, every our genes, you know, are pretty incredible in terms of the miracle of the whole evolutionary process that they're carrying in. So whether or not we can recover it consciously or let that part that is running the show unconsciously communicate more to the surface of our mind so we can benefit from its long adaptational evolutionary advantage, I don't know. But the Buddha was much more practical and he just wanted to get you on the path to understand the cause of suffering, which is clinging to any kind of desire, and then the letting go of that suffering by not clinging to it and the different meditative practices that help the part of you see this truly and then let go so that spontaneously your life is awake and alive moment to moment, not holding on to past, not projecting into the future, just being with the what is, the now, and the different kinds of depths that you can get into by having your life, your life so submerged in it. Nonetheless, just to remind you what he was trying to get across and how we have to accept what the teachers have to give us, knowing that they convey more than they say, even if we can't fully plumb the depth of what their mind is or what mind or consciousness ultimately is in and of itself, because especially if it's infinite and defies description, just play with the symbols. So story to end for today was... The Buddha once picked up a handful of leaves from the floor of the forest where the monks and the nuns were listening to his discourse. And he says, O oh, monks and nuns, are there more f leaves in my hand or more leaves in the forest? Of course, all the monks and nuns answer, O oh, venerable sir, more leaves in the forest. He says, Well, what I know compared to what I can teach you is like the leaves that are in my hand compared to the leaves in the forest. But just what's in my hand the leaves in my hand are enough to get you to nirvana. Right. I love it. I think it's just like Rumi's story. So you don't have to know how much wine is really in the tavern. You just have to drink enough to get yourself drunk. Have a great day.